Well, praise the Lord. Um, it's so wonderful to be here um, in Ireland, but with you. And welcome to the new guests. And I'm just thankful to be together, loving Jesus. And um, we just pray that the Lord himself ministers. Um, it felt like the Spirit kind of shared some verses for us today. And I love that because we're able to just, all of us together as the, the sheep of his pasture, look at his word and let God himself minister to our hearts. His ministry. He is our, as Jim so preciously prayed, he's our shepherd. And we're just there in his green pasture together this morning and allowing the word to feed us, the Lord to feed us, his word. So, if you have your Bibles, we will be going through scriptures. However, I will be reading the verses to you, so that may be of help also. But we're going to begin in the beginning, in John 1.1, 1, 1, and um, Francine or Bia read that, and we're going to look at it again. John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And um, just that last bit, that from before time, before us, the Word was God, and the Word is God. It's a person, it's the Trinity, three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Isn't it just wonderful that the Word is the Godhead, is a person, is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's not a teaching we have to attain to, like Hart couldn't get it, but she can, because it's not something we learn, it's someone we know who was even before us. So that verse, the Word was God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah for that. John 5, chapter uh, chapter 5, verses 39 through 40. I'm just going to read them. It's John chapter 5, 39 through 40. Jesus said, Search the scriptures, for in them you have, you think you have, eternal life. But they are they which testify of me. Jesus said that. Testify of me. And he was speaking to Pharisees when he said this. And he said, but you will not come to me that you might have life, that you might have life. So Jesus is saying in a certain sense in those verses, if you come to me, who is a person, you can have life. Where these men were searching the scriptures to find eternal life through teaching. And they couldn't do it because they wouldn't come. To him. So what a precious invitation from the very heart of Jesus. Now, let's go to John chapter 6, verse 63. Again, I'll just read it, but you're welcome to turn there. Jesus said, and again, we're looking at the Word. We're looking at Scripture. We're looking at Jesus and the, the Word of God talking to us about the Word. John chapter 6 uh, verse 63 says, and Jesus said this again, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and life. Jesus said in John 6, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So here's the first question that I felt the Lord asked me to ask us today. What is a spirit word. You don't have to answer. It's just something to think about. What is a life word? Jesus said, my words are spirit and they're life. So what is a spirit word? What is a life word? In that same verse, Jesus said this, it is the spirit that makes it come alive. It is the spirit that makes my words come alive. 
The flesh profits nothing. It is my spirit that makes my words come alive. The flesh profiteth nothing. And I thought about another verse that Paul shared that said those same words of profiting nothing. It's in 1 Corinthians 13, in verse 2. Paul shared this with the Corinthians. Though I understand all mysteries and have all knowledge, without love, it profits nothing. Without love. Without love. Interesting that I could have all understanding and understand every mystery there is to know in the Bible. But without love, it actually says I am nothing. But it also says it profits nothing. But the Spirit makes things alive. And love makes things profit. And the Word is a person. And He is calling us by name. And he wants to live in us by his life, through his spirit. Does it get any better than that? Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Jesus said that. And he opened his arms on the cross. And he opened his heart on the shores of Galilee. And he said, hey, hey lads, come unto me. And what will I give you? All of me. There's that old song, all of me. Why not take all of me? You guys know that one? <laughs> Jesus is singing that to us this morning. All of me. Why not take all of me? Come unto me and take all of me. Not my teaching, but me, my life. He gave us himself. Isn't he beautiful? He could have just gave us a big book and said, learn it, come back, pass the quiz, you get to go to heaven. When you get a C or above, St. Peter will let you in. <laughs> go back, study, we got this big room called purgatory. When you're done, you get a C plus, you're in. He didn't say that. He said, come to me, weak, heavy laden. He even said it to the sinners and the prostitutes. Ooh. Don't tell the Pharisees. They get very mad that the sinners get to come to Jesus and take all of me. How could he be so full of love? It's who he is. It's who he is. And he is the, starts with a W, he's the word. Oh, it's getting better and better. He's so beautiful. He's so beautiful. His heart is so beautiful. So God is. In the Bible, it says God is certain things. Other places, it says he does certain. He heals. Right? He heals. He multiplies loaves and fishes. These are things he does. He does miracles. But God is love. God is love. And God is also spirit. Isn't that wonderful? It's who he is. It's who he is, not just what he does. It's who he is. And he's welcoming us with open arms and a big invitation to come and partake. Now, we're going to take a little turn here, but it's not really a turn. It's, it's the next step. It's in Ezekiel chapter 37, and I'm going to read verses 13 and 14. Now, this is really in flow with the things we've been sharing from the previous scriptures, but it sounds different. Chapter 37 of Ezekiel, verse 13. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. And I will put my spirit inside of you, and you will live. And I will put my spirit inside of you, and you will live. The spirit and the breath of God opened the graves of his people and brought them up 
out of a grave into new life. How wonderful. Here's the question I have. Next question. Not literally speaking, but in a, in a certain sense, what is a grave? Because the people Ezekiel was prophesying to were not in graves, literally. They were still alive. But God said spiritually they were in a grave. So what is a grave, if I could be in one while I'm still alive? I had a thought, and I'll just submit that to you, that maybe it's an entrapment where I'm buried deep in the earth, where I'm trapped deep in the earth, and I can't see the light of day, can't get up, can't live. I know I've felt that way many times. I think all of us have where we're under and we're stuck, we can't move. Buried in the earth, rather than swallowed up of Jesus. Well, in the early church, when the Apostle John was sent to the island of Patmos and wrote the book of Revelation, one of the first things God had him do was to write to seven churches that were still alive but were stuck deep in the earth, stuck in their problems, stuck in their situations, and they could not get free. And he wrote them a letter. He sent his express, Jesus said to, to John, I'm sure some of you know this in, John, in Revelation chapter one, God says, John, please write to the seven churches. I have a letter. Jesus said, I have a letter I want to write to them. So he sent them his word. And each church you can read in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation is a letter from the heart of Jesus to one of the churches that are stuck in the earth, in their graves, in their hard situations. But Jesus did not, in his letter, give them an answer of how to get um, through their earth crisis. The, the letter to the churches, the letters to the churches in Revelation, they're not instruction manuals on how to get free from the hard times that we all go through. And after, at the end of every letter, almost like his signature at the bottom of each page, he says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. So we're back to the Spirit sharing the word in a way that makes us free, brings us to life, brings us to Jesus, the real Jesus. He says exactly the same line, seven times to seven different churches. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And then each letter has a special treasure hidden in it from the very heart of Jesus. It says, for those who do hear and open up to what the Spirit says in the letter, they will not get a better earth life per se. Maybe not get a fixed situation down in the earth, but they will know God himself in an amazing, if I could use the word oneness, union, life, vine to branch, flow. They'll get to eat the hidden manna. They'll have the morning star in them. They'll be in the paradise of God. They'll be made a pillar in God's temple. They'll sit with God in his throne. How many people feel that's better than just getting my problem fixed down here? Mm -hmm. To sit with God in his throne to have them, to be in the paradise of God. Lord, that's getting out of my grave. That's better than getting out of my grave. <laughs> what an answer, what an answer. So the question now is, how do we hear the Spirit? If the seven churches read those letters and they were going, now, what will help me pay my rent better? And how can I fix Sister Susie? And how can I deal with my boss? Jesus wasn't telling them that. 
His answer was himself, and himself in a way where they'd be with him more, instead of down here without him. But he who hath an ear, let him hear. He who hath an ear, let him hear. Sometimes in my life, the problem is my ear is so attuned to my needs and my problems listen close, that I can't hear the heart of Jesus crying out for me to be with him. My ear, it just doesn't hear his heart cries. But when my ear hears the heart of God calling me by name, the spirit opening up God's heart for me, something changes. How do I hear Jesus' words? How do I hear the spirit's invitation? Just going to read a quick verse. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. But as it is written, I cannot and has not seen. Ear has not heard. Neither has it entered into the heart of any man. The things that God has prepared for them that love him. But God wants to show us all of it by his spirit. His very spirit that has searched the deep, things of God and wants to freely give it, it all to us. Well, how amazing is that? It's beyond what we could even dream or understand the things, his answers, himself. How do we hear the Spirit? How are we brought out of our graves? This is the question. How? How does this wonderful transition from my grave to the paradise of God to knowing him, like Jennifer saying so beautifully, happen. Well, in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, which Francine read, is part of the answer. Let's turn to that one. Revelation chapter 4, in verse 1. And if you don't have your Bible, I'll read it. It says, After this I looked. After what? This is the first verse of chapter 4. So it's after all those seven letters and all the problems. After all of that, it says, I looked, and behold, guess what I saw? A door was open in heaven, and I heard a voice saying, come up here. Everybody just say it together. Come up here. Come up here. Come up here. You know, I remember the first time I came to Ireland, and my life in earth was one of the worst it's ever been. I couldn't wait to get away. And as that plane started going a little bit higher, it's like my city, you know, my house started getting smaller and that felt good. And then, you know, the place that I worked got smaller and that felt better. And then the whole state I lived in got smaller. That felt really good. And then I broke through the clouds and I couldn't see any of it. And that felt the best. And then I saw the sun up there in pure blue. And I thought, oh to be swallowed up of life. Whew! Higher and higher, Lord, deeper and deeper into you. And the Lord said, hey, why don't you just come on up here? Come up here. Leave it and come unto me. Sometimes that's so hard to do. It's so hard. But Jesus says, just come. Just come as you are. Come unto me. His heart says come. His spirit opens that invitation. He knows Jesus' love for you. He knows that he died so that you could come freely. And all of me, Jesus said, can be in you. All of Jesus. He doesn't hold back anything. He's so beautiful. And so these people that are here from Texas and Belgium that we've been meeting, Arkansas, they received an invitation from Fire Ministries. Oh, how long ago was it? Three, four months, who knows? I sent them an invitation, and I said, Fire Ministries is opening a door for you to come to Ireland and experience what God has for you there. And some of them answered the invitation, opened their hearts, they responded, they came, and they walked the island with Jesus for over seven days or more, and Hopefully, the Lord has been wonderful in this time with him. They responded. They said, I take that invitation. 
I answer that invitation. I even spend some money to go where that invitation is sending me. I'm going to get on an airplane and I'm going to ride there and I'm going. That's just a small little example about the invitation the Holy Spirit is sending us today and every day. He's coming on the wings of a dove to our hearts saying, God's opened a door into not Ireland, heaven, into the heavens of his heart. And he's saying, come, come up here. He who hath an ear to hear, come. I have opened myself. The invitation is sent. The wedding feast is prepared. Shout it to the byways and the highways. He is ready. He's ready for you. He's open. A door has been opened. Some will hear. Some will come. Some will find more than earth answers. They will find God himself as their portion. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. If Jesus was the answer, what an answer he would be. And in closing, we say again, how to hear this invitation brought to us by the Holy Spirit with love, like Kate, the heart lady, showed us with an open heart. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 through 18 says, when our hearts turn to the Lord, there is a freedom from the Holy Spirit to look into the face of Jesus and to be changed into God's image. How wonderful. How wonderful. We would let love for God, love for God, open our hearts to respond to his invitation. We let love for God open our hearts to respond to his invitation. And in closing, I'm just going to read over you just to bless you a few strange but wonderful scriptures from the Old Testament about opening our hearts to receive God's invitation. And then we will be finished. You don't have to turn there. I'm going to read quickly through these. First Kings chapter 6 and verse 18. And the cedar of God's house within was carved with knops and open flowers. All was cedar. There was no stone seen there. No stony hearts. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verses 2 and 5. Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled. I rose to open to my beloved. My hands dropped with myrrh, my fingers with sweet smelling myrrh. Isaiah 28, verse 24. Doth the plowman plow all day to sow? Doth he open and break the clods of his ground? Isaiah 45, verse 8. Drop down, you heavens, from above. Let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open and let them bring forth salvation. And finally, Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and gave thanks to his God as he did aforetime. time. So Lord, we just thank you for your open heart, your outpoured love, your eternal invitation to come unto you who was before us and ever will be our life. Thank you for your cross where you died to open that door into yourself for any who are hungry, any who are thirsty, to freely come and be with you, partake of you, receive not just your forgiveness, yes, but your life. Or let your spirit breathe your invitation into our hearts today that we might love you where you are at and be fruitful by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.